never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me And your love never fails strong and the water's deep I'm not alone here on these open seas Your love never fails The chasm was far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side Your love never fails You stay the same through the ages And your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me your love never fails You make all things work together for my good You make all things Work together for my good You make all things Work together for my good You make all things Work together for my good You stay the same through the ages your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been Faithful you will be You pledge yourself to me 
And it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips ah, 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 ah. Father, the orphan, your kindness makes us whole, and you shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. Now you're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes, for you will have your bride. Free of all her guilt, and rid of all her shame, known by her true name. And it's why I sing, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you be praised, you will be praised, with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon
ground began to shake The stone was rolled away His perfect love did not be overcome Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you It's been 24 weeks since we last met on a Sunday morning for our Olive service at the church building. Next Sunday, however, we hope to start gathering again in the mornings. And so the 11 a.m. stream will be a live broadcast of the service and will begin to look a bit more like normal church. We'll speak more about that later on. 
But in the meantime, we're delighted that you've joined us today. You are most welcome. Over those past 24 weeks, many of you have sent in video hellos, and we'd like to watch those by way of adding to our welcome. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Hola, Brunsfield. Good morning, everyone. Morning, morning everyone. everyone. Morning everyone. Yeah, good morning. Good morning everybody. Good, good morning, morning everyone. everyone. Good morning Brunsfield. Good morning Brunsfield. Good morning. Good morning everyone from Valley Walbert Garden Centre. Good morning, morning everyone. everyone. We miss you. We miss you. Good morning Brunsfield. Good morning Brunsfield. Good morning, Brunsfield. Good morning, good morning everybody. everybody. Hi. Morning. morning. Good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Brunsfield. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Brunsfield. Good morning, Brunsfield. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Brunsfield family. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Good morning, everyone. We miss you. Good morning, church family. We miss you. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all keeping well. So over the next hour or so, we're going to focus on Jesus and how we in no way deserve all that he has done for us through his death and resurrection. We're going to hear from lots of different people today. We'll pray together and Peter will speak to the kids. As ever, do get in touch using the email in the description below if there's anything you want to discuss or if we can help in any way. The message this morning is from a good friend of the church, Bob Ackroyd, who is a lecturer at ETS. He'll be looking at Romans chapter 8, which speaks a lot about who we are in relation to God. Loved by him, accepted by him, made free in him. And that's echoed in the words of our first worship song, who you say I am. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for his love for me who the sun sets free oh his free
Simon says, you know what Simon yeah. says? Yeah. So what you need to do is you need to do whatever G says, but not whatever P says, okay? So you need to be listening and you might need to be watching carefully as well to see is it G or is it P? Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, yeah. All right, G says stand up. Okay, you're doing that at home? Good, All right, everyone. Oh, you need to be quicker than that onto the floor. Okay, right. Okay, G says, sit down. Okay, P says, stand up. G says, stand up. Okay, G says, clap your hands. G says, stop. Okay, G says, arm up high. Which arm? It doesn't matter. Okay, G says, two arms up. Okay, P says, arms down. Oh, oh no. no, don't do what P says, only do what G says. Right, okay, G, no, P says, sit down. No, I, I'm confusing myself. P says, sit down. Oh, baby. Right, G says, sit down. Okay, G says, stand up and run on the spot. Okay, G says, stop. G says, fold your arms. Okay, P says, unfold your arms. Good, they didn't do it. Okay, good. Okay, right. P says sit down. They didn't do it, good. Okay. And P says run on the spot. Okay, G says run on the spot. Okay, G says stop. G says jump. G says stop. G says jump, jump, jump. G says stop. P says jump, jump, jump. Right. P says sit down. P says sit down. Oh. Uh, oh. I just wanted to do it. P says sit down. P says sit down. P says sit down. No. G says run on the spot. G says stop. And sit down. Sit down. Okay. So what was that all about? Well, who have we been learning about? Moses. We've been learning about Moses. Okay. How? How did you get on uh, at home there? Did you manage to do what G says and not do what P says? Yes, I did. Well, um, you could probably guess that the G stood for God, God okay? Because in the story of Moses, what we'll be learning about this morning is that... Sit up. Okay, we're learning about uh, the fact that the people needed to listen to God, okay? Moses was listening to God, but there was somebody who wasn't listening to God. Do you know who that was? Pharaoh. It was Pharaoh. Pharaoh. That's what the P stood for, for Pharaoh, okay? Pharaoh thought he was like a god. He was probably the most powerful person in the whole earth, okay? But God is more powerful than that and than him, okay? And God showed Pharaoh that he was more powerful, okay? He showed Pharaoh lots of miracles, okay? He sent plagues to Pharaoh because Moses was saying... And really, it was God that was saying, through Moses, that Pharaoh needed to let God's people go. But Pharaoh said, no. 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 He wasn't listening to God. So God sent plagues. He turned the Nile water into blood. He sent uh, frogs. He sent flies. He sent gnats. Uh, he sent giant hail that 
uh, destroyed their crops. Okay, he sent all these different plagues. And we were thinking about the first nine plagues that God sent. Okay, to try to show to show Pharaoh that he needed to listen to God. But God still did but um but Pharaoh still didn't listen to God. Pharaoh still didn't obey. Okay? And we need to listen to God and obey God, and everyone needs to do that. And what's the most important thing that we need to do that God says? And that, that is trust in Jesus. So that we can be forgiven for all the times that we haven't listened to God and we haven't obeyed God. Okay, like when you didn't do what Jesus said. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you sent him. And help us to obey you by putting our trust in Jesus. And thank you that through Jesus we can be forgiven for all the times that we haven't listened and obeyed you, God. So we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Many thanks, Peter. So let's speak a little bit about next week's service, which will still be at 11 a.m. The restrictions mean that we can only have 50 people in any part of the building at any time. So we'll basically have to take turns, with most of us watching the live YouTube stream at home, either at the same time or later on. So you need to reserve a seat by using the links in one of the regular update emails or from the website homepage. We'll also hold a few seats for visitors that don't have to be booked. We'd love to see you. We've made every effort to comply with all the guidelines and we want it to feel as safe as possible, although there is no pressure if you feel uncomfortable. Although there will be no creche or kids' church initially, younger children and babies are very welcome to sit with parents and there will be a room available in case you need to pop out with your little ones. And for at least the month of September, there will be the opportunity to take communion at the end of the service. So just a few practical things to mention to set expectations if you haven't made it to any of the initial evening services. When moving around, we need to observe the two metre spacing as we do when we're out elsewhere. We'll be asked to use hand sanitizer on the way in and the way out. We're not allowed to sing, so we'll continue to watch the band tracks like we do at the moment. The kids' talk will also be pre-recorded, but everything else will be live from the platform here. Stewards will show us to our seats and will direct traffic on exit to make sure that we don't get too close to each other. We will also be allocated a numbered seat that adheres to the capacity rules. Oh, and we all need to wear one of these. <laughs> now, we are eager to get the Embassy Youth Group back together after a long absence, and we will be prioritising them and their families for the first couple of weeks back. Here's Archie to introduce you to a number of them so you know who they are, after which we'll have a time of prayer. Uh, hello, my name is Archie. I'm one of the ministry trainees here at Brunsfield and I head up some of the youth work uh, with the embassy. Uh, and we are really excited to be able to be meeting again very soon. Um, but in the meantime, here are some of the members uh, of the embassy uh, who want to say hello to you at uh, their church. Hi, Brunsfield. I like to play basketball. Guten Tag. Hello. Hello, Brunsfield. Morning, Brunsfield. Hello. Good morning. Let us pray. God in heaven, we praise your holy name. We come this morning with glad praise for all your wonderful creation, your provision of our needs, and your outstanding love to each one of us. God, you sent Jesus into this world to free us from our sin. We confess now how we often fail you. We could never come up to your standards, but often we forget to rely on you. We forget to bring our worries, our difficulties to you. And yet, God, you still love us. We confess now our faults and our sins before you now.
Lord, we thank you that Brunsfield is a church that has many young people and children associated with us. And we thank you for blessing us as a fellowship with these young people and their families. We thank you for the work that's done in Kids Church and Creche and in the Embassy um, over recent months, um, in particular when we've had to do services via Zoom and, and online. We thank you, especially that the Embassy are going to be able to rejoin us in the church for the All Age service next Sunday. Um, and we pray that as the final preparations are put in place for this, that this might be um, a service which, although very different to the ones prior to lockdown, might be one that is um, exciting for the young people to be able to come along to um, and that they might enjoy meeting their friends, meeting the leaders and being able to talk about what, what has happened um, over the lockdown period as well as being able to explore your word um, and spend some time together studying it. Dear Lord, thank you that you are in totally in control of all things and have a plan for each one of our lives. Thank you that in our suffering you long for us to draw closer to you, to seek you and experience more of your word. Thank you that you sent Jesus to give an ultimate example of suffering and how to bear it and glorify you through it. Lord, I pray particularly for those members in the church who are suffering. Some will not have told anyone and will be struggling in silence. And I pray that they would not only cry out to you, Jesus, but also to seek help from others who would respond with love and wisdom. I pray that you would guide them and hold them firmly so that although their burden is heavy, they can give it to you to carry in faith. We pray for Finney Houston, who has been unwell and is in hospital, and for strength for his family members, including Pauline, his daughter. We think of Irene Ray, who is settling into Camilla House care home and still has limited mobility. The Ponton family, especially Fiona and her health problems. Ali and Brooke Wilson, who continue to recover at home. And we pray for others who have had ill health, including Gordon and Lilius Gray and Dorothy Layton and those who cannot work due to health issues. I thank you for their perseverance in Christ. There are also others suffering from ill health and struggling in different ways. And I pray that they would really know you in this difficult time. Give them strength to persevere and guide them in their choices and the way that they deal with difficult emotions. Psalm 34 verses 17 to 18 says, The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Thank you, Lord, that we cry out and you hear. We bring to you our prayers for the city of Edinburgh and as we do so we are very aware that needs are great and even with our best efforts we're aware there is so little that we ourselves can do but we can pray and we can share the good news the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and so Lord we pray particularly that you will bless the preaching of your words through the online services here at Brunsfield and the outreach of the church both individually and collectively, through the work of Basics Bank, Bethany and the Edinburgh City Mission. And we would pray not just for ourselves, but for fellow believers in this city and for congregations, that you will bless them as they reach out to people to show them the love of Christ. And we pray that many lives will be changed. Father, we pray for your help as we resume morning services next Sunday. We pray that you will help with all the organisation of this, that all may go smoothly and safely. But most of all, that you would be glorified through all we do. We particularly pray for those who are still unable to meet with us. We pray that they won't feel forgotten or left out, but will be aware of our love and care for them and of your presence with them. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let's pray. Abba, Father, we thank you for your world. Thank you for its beauty, its nature, its seasons, its resources. Help us take better care of it, Lord. And we thank you for everyone who lives in it. And we delight in hearing about Africa being declared polio-free this week. 
We praise you, God. And Lord, we ask for your help uh, with the coronavirus, that you would halt its spread. There are many poor countries that are struggling to cope with it, and the, the rapid increase in numbers in Latin America and, and Africa, Lord, have mercy. And Lord, we ask for your mercy also in those caught up in the hurricanes in America, in the Caribbean and in Texas and Louisiana, where many lives have been lost, many people in mourning and in floods, many people displaced. Lord, have mercy. And would you raise up your people to help those that are suffering? And we thank you for your people helping in Lebanon, where we hear about Tear Fund being at work with those who have um, had suffering and trauma from the explosion that happened there. Lord, we pray that you would bless their work. And Father, we pray for justice in our world. We pray for those who are involved in the protests against racism in America. And Lord, we long for there to be an end to racism in the systems, in society and in people. Not just in America, Lord, but here in us too. And we pray for the town of Kenosha where there has been shootings and we pray for the, the healing of Jacob Blake that he might be able to walk again. We pray for his family. Father, we also pray for those involved in the other shootings too, that you would bring comfort to those who mourn. And Lord, we long for your justice to be done. And Father, we think also of those people around the world that have dropped off our news feeds. We ask that you would remember them, those that are starving in South Sudan, the people in crisis in Yemen, and the Rohingya people, and many others displaced, away from home, and unable to sustain themselves. And we pray for those who seek refuge in our towns and cities, Lord. And we pray, we know that you've told your people to, to welcome the foreigner and to leave the edges of our fields unharvested that they might be able to come and eat. And Lord, we lament this week and we repent um, over the, the death of Mercy, Mercy Baguma. And we pray that you would comfort her family and her child at this time. Lord, Show us how we can help those who seek refuge here. And Father, we thank you that we can bring before you all these people because we know you care. Thank you that you care about our world. And would you show us this week how that we can respond best? Would you prompt us to continue to pray? In Jesus' name, Amen. Love 
chains Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb Every knee will bow before him And who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Now, a few people have moved on during the summer because they've finished studies or have new jobs. And, of course, we've not had the opportunity to say goodbye. Wes Brewer has gone on to work at the Faith Mission. Daniel Lockhart has finished uni. And here's what three others are up to. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Alice, and I was, have been going to Brunsfield Evangelical during my time studying in Harriet Watt. And so over... COVID over, uh, I've just graduated, so I won't be back in Edinburgh, unfortunately. Very, very sad to say, because best city ever. Um, so, well, hopefully I'll be back to visit. But, um, so I, next in life, I don't really know what's coming next for me, to be honest. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in quarantine, just in God's presence and praying about it. And, um, so yeah, I'm just going to be living at home for the next few months and working in a cafe, saving some money, hopefully. And then I don't really know what's coming next, but I'm going to keep applying for different internships and things and wait patiently to see where God's going to lead me. I think it's quite good for us to wait in patience and wait in hope and hoping in God for what's coming next. I think um, it's a good way to grow your faith and... So yeah, hopefully something that's gonna glorify God, that's what I hope my future will involve. So I guess we'll see. Please keep me in your prayers um, and thank you. I will miss you all, bye bye. Hello everyone. Uh, hard to believe that my two years that I spent in Edinburgh are actually over now. I'm back in Northern Ireland and I am due to begin next Tuesday as the assistant pastor of Banbridge Baptist Church over here in Northern Ireland. So I would really appreciate prayer um, as I start there. Uh, let me say at this time, thank you so much to so many of you at, at Brunsfield who took time to care for me over the past two years, to chat to me on a Sunday morning, uh, to pray for me, to meet with me, to grab a coffee with me. I have really appreciated my time in Edinburgh and having fellowship with you there at Brunsfield. I will pray on for you. I pray that the Lord Jesus will continue to use the church there, and that many people will be one for Christ. Uh, you have played a massive role in my time in Scotland, and I trust when I'm across in Edinburgh that I'll still be welcome to come along. But do do can do please pray for me um, as I begin at Banbridge Baptist Church there. God bless. Hi, Brentsfield family. My name is Megan, and I wanted to update you guys on what's next for me. So starting mid-September, I'll be beginning an internship at P's and G's Church, partnered with Young Life, which is a Christian-based international charity that works with youth in schools. Um, so what that will look like is I'll be getting support and mentoring from the church 
and working with the youth group within P's and G's and then also working in schools partnered with Young Life um, doing youth work and offering support and mentorship there. So ways that you guys can be praying for me for this next year specifically would be two in particular. Um, given the current COVID situation, we are going to have to be extra creative in just the way that youth work looks this next year and how we can best offer friendship and support to youth, uh, both within the church and also in schools partnered with Young Life. Um, and then the second is I'm still finishing my master's dissertation that will be due in November. So pray for wisdom, focus, and motivation to be able to finish that well. Thank you guys so much. The evening service and communion is at 6 p.m. tonight. Do join by Zoom if you don't have a reservation to be here in person. And remember that the Zoom prayer meetings are moving to Mondays and Thursdays only from this week, reflecting the easing of restrictions and diaries becoming busier again. We've been so encouraged with the run of 162 daily prayer meetings over the last few months. So let's just ask for God's help before we have the reading, which is an amazing section of Romans chapter 8 from verse 18, and hear Bob's message. Lord, will you just make us receptive to what you have to teach us today? Amen. Verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present day. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that he was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Good morning and welcome. It's a great privilege always to be at Brunsfield Evangelical. It would be much better to be with you in person, but I understand that's happening next week. But it's a privilege to bring God's word to you and to proclaim in Jesus who we are, not what others might think and not even what we might think ourselves, but what God has to say to us, about us, and for us. 
So with you this morning, I'd like to look at the passage that has been read, Romans chapter 8 and verses 18 to 39. It's that chunk uh, of scripture, actually from verse 28 to the end of the chapter. It's that chunk of scripture that is so familiar, so precious, so encouraging. And maybe for you, it might not be a familiar passage, but as you heard those words read, I'd like to highlight a few of the truths that are contained. The famous CBS News anchorman, uh, Walter Cronkite, he would always sign off his broadcasts on CBS Evening News with these words, and that's the way it is. Well, as we move ourselves back to 57 AD or thereabouts, we're with the Apostle Paul, and as he's writing to this Roman church, what is the way it is? How is it? in Rome for his audience. What is it like? What is happening? Well, let me just say that it's not a propitious time to be a follower of Jesus in the first century AD. To be there in the heart of Rome, at the center of the empire, that is not the place that you would want to be as a follower of Jesus. Why? Because in this city that is filled with emblems of power and authority and glory and majesty, none of those emblems proclaim Jesus. And to proclaim your allegiance to Jesus means that you are no longer allied to Caesar, that you are no longer one of his followers because you have a greater master, a higher Lord, and your allegiance is to that Lord Jesus Christ. So a Christian in the first century AD is in the minority. They are weak. They are often despised. They often can seem to be marginalized because they are marginalized. And what's more, we find that this early church has its fair share of problems internally. So it's not just external pressure, there's internal problems. There's moral lapses and decay. There's internal theological debates and heresies. So you think 2,000 years ago, it is not a great time to be a follower of Jesus. Maybe let's fast forward to 20 centuries, and you might think if Cronkite would say, and that's the way it is here today, the end of August 2020, it is not a good time to be a follower of Jesus. It's not easy. We seem to be in the minority. We seem to be despised. We have our fair share of problems externally and our fair share of problems internally. But with that rather bleak introduction, let me tell you what God says. Let me tell you what the Apostle Paul says to this small and despised and divided and vulnerable group of believers at the heart of the Roman Empire. He says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? You see, when God is on your side, or rather when you are on his side, a, one person can become a majority. One person or a small group can be in the ascendancy, not because of who they are, but because who they are aligned to. And I want you to think of those words, God is for us. And the question, who can stand against, who can be against us? What shall we say? What shall we say in response to these great truths? How can we comprehend them first? How can we respond to them secondly? And what does, the, what does this mean for us today? Here, the end of August 2020, the city center of Edinburgh, coming out of lockdown, because we might have a lot of ideas about ourselves. The culture or society around us might have their own opinions of us. But let me remind you that what God says is true, always true. And what he says about you is the most important verdict of anyone or the most important assessment. And with you today, I'd like just to notice a few things that leap off the page. Because what the Apostle Paul has to say is positive, encouraging. And so often we find it difficult temperamentally to hear the positive, to hear the encouraging. We hear something positive and in our minds we counterbalance that or we, or we uh, simply reject what we've heard. I was listening to Radio 4, which is always a good endeavor. If you're not a Radio 4 listener, I hope you become one. But on Radio 4, I heard a psychiatrist say that for every one negative thing that you or I hear, 
we need to hear at least five positive things to balance out the negative. Now you might say, well, that's secular psychi psychiatric nonsense. Well, my colleagues um, in the seminary where I work who study uh, Christian counseling say that that's true, but it's actually probably even greater. That for every one negative thing you, he you hear about yourself, you need to hear seven or more positive things to balance that out. Why? Because temperamentally we are more inclined to believe the negative, more inclined to believe the, what's wrong rather than what's good or what's right. So what God is saying here in his word is that he is for us. And in the scripture, there are some magnificent truths that come before our attention. And you think of the incarnation, and you think of the birth of Jesus, and how is that described? Well, Jesus is given among many names, Emmanuel, God with us. So God is with us. He's now come down to our level. He's now pitched his tent. He's made his dwelling among us, God with us. The second great redemptive event in the New Testament is the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost. And what does that mean? That means that now God is dwelling in us, that the Holy Spirit has come, is poured out on the church, so that we are now filled with the Spirit. That instead of weakness, there's strength. Instead of deadness, there's life. Instead of separation from God, there's union with God through Jesus Christ. God with us, incarnation, God in us, the truth of Pentecost and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and here before us, God for us. This great work of Jesus Christ, the atonement, this demonstrates that God is for us. And who is the us? The us is the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, the weak, the strong, the wise, the foolish, that person who placed their, their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are one of that category, I'm not asking you how much you know. I'm not asking you how consistent your walk is. I'm not asking how deep or how strong your spiritual life might be. But if your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul is speaking to you. And if your faith is not yet in the Lord Jesus Christ, he still speaks to you. And by, and by demonstrating this reality, he wants to present to you this truth of the gospel. So this is hope for the believer, and this is hope for the non-believer, but this hope is found only in one person, and that's in the person of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. There's a great summary that was given by John Wesley. John Wesley, that great preacher uh, of the awakening. And John Wesley continually preached on the new birth. You must be born again. And he said, you can summarize it in this way. He said, if any doctrines within the whole compass of Christianity may be properly termed fundamental, they are doubtless these two, the doctrine of, regen of justification and that of the new birth. The former relating to that great work which God does for us in forgiving our sins, and the latter in that great work which God does in us. And it's with this great truth, God for us, the work of Jesus on the cross, that I want to begin to answer a few of the questions that the Apostle Paul raises. Now, I understand that your minister had a previous career, that he seemed to be in the, the career of law. So, too, the Apostle Paul has a legal mind and has a reasoning mind. And very often, the illustrations that the Apostle Paul brings us into include the law court, not exclusively. But we have here the law court brought before us very powerfully. Because what does the Apostle Paul do? He raises three questions. He talks about a charge. He talks about condemnation. And he talks about separation. Now, in so doing, he's basically framing what a court case looks like, especially a criminal court case. Because in a case of law, you would have the defendant in, in the dock. And the defendant would be charged with some crime, some misdemeanor, some felony, some less than serious or some very serious crime. So there's a charge. And there's the finding, is this person innocent? Is this person guilty? Now in ancient Rome, they didn't have the not proven 
uh, verdict as you do here in Scotland. But So you have the charge and then you either have the acquittal or you have the condemnation. And the condemnation is that the punishment belongs to the guilty. The person who is guilty will be punished in some way. And the third phase is the phase of separation. Now, we see this in the court cases today, that if somebody is found guilty, they are punished. They might be fined. That means that they're separated from some of their money. They might be imprisoned. I'm a prison chaplain, and Monday mornings, I'll find myself in Stockton Prison, and there you have a group of men and women who are separated from their families, separated from their homes, separated from society. And in the case of capital punishment, which would be a capital, which certainly existed in ancient Rome, in a case of a capital charge and a capital uh, verdict of guilty, there would be separation from life itself. So with you, just briefly, I'd like you to notice these three questions that the Apostle Paul asks and answers, but all within the context of the Son. At least six times in these few verses, Jesus Christ is mentioned by name or referred to as son or referenced as him six times in just a few verses, which remind us that the message here from beginning to end is about Jesus. Now, that's just not a truism that's good for Sunday school lessons. You know, the story of the child who was asked in a children's address, what do you call the animal that lives in a tree and has a bushy tail and gathers nuts? Child raises his hand and says, I know the answer is Jesus, but it sounds like a squirrel. Now, this isn't a Sunday school answer, but the answer is Jesus. The answer is Jesus to each of the three questions that Paul presents. And let's look at them in turn. We're told that Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son, was not spared. That he was given up for us all. And that if that was the gift... How much more will God graciously give us, in verse 32, all things that are necessary? God is for us. Who can be against us? He didn't spare his son. He gave him for us all. And look at verse 33, which is question number one. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who will bring a charge? Who will bring a charge against you? Who will bring a charge against me? Who will accuse us of doing wrong? Well, that's a long list, isn't it? We have our own conscience. We have the evil one. We have our family. We have our friends. We have our colleagues. We have our neighbors. There's no list, uh, there's no end to the list of those who could bring a charge against us. And sadly, very often that charge is true because we are not the people that we are meant to be. I came across this uh, extract from uh, Pilgrim's Progress. And this is where Christian encounters Apollyon, the evil one. And in the dialogue, Apollyon says to Christian, um, thou hast already been unfaithful in thy service to him, to your prince. How dost thou think to receive wages of him? Christian responds, wherein, O Apollyon, have I been unfaithful to him? Thou didst faint at first setting out. When thou wast almost choked in the gulf of despond, thou didst attempt wrong ways to be rid of thy burden, whereas thou should have stayed till thy prince had taken it off. Thou didst sinfully sleep and lose thy choice thing. Thou wast also persuaded to go back at the sight of the lions, and when thou talkest of thy journey and of what thou hast seen and heard, thou art inwardly desirous of vain glory in all that thou sayest or doest. Listen to Christian's response. All this is true, and much more which thou hast left out. But the prince whom I serve and honor is merciful and ready to forgive. You see, all these charges, the Christian says, are true. And what's more, your charge is inadequate because I'm actually much worse than you suggest. That my crimes, that my, my sins are far more than you bring before me. Who will bring a charge? against one whom God has chosen. No, listen to the answer. It is God who justifies. God who declares you righteous. Oh yes, the charge is true in a sense. You are guilty. But now the gospel, because of the atoning work of Jesus Christ and the cross, not spared but given up, God can declare you righteous and just. He can maintain his justice and declare the sinner justified. 
That's the good news. Notice in verse 34, question number two, the condemnation question. Who is he that condemns? Now, condemnation means that you are found guilty in the courtroom of God. We've already said that the charges are actually true. That we are sinful by action, sinful by nature, sinful by word, sinful by thought. That we don't do the things we should, that we do the things that we shouldn't time and time again. And sin has a consequence. The wages of sin, we're told, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Who is he that condemns? Well, the answer again, Sunday school answer, but nonetheless true, Christ Jesus who died. So the condemnation fell on him, the innocent for the guilty, the one who was pure for the impure, the one who was right for the one who was wrong. The condemnation falls, absolutely, but the condemnation fell 2,000 years ago on the cross, on Christ, so that condemnation now cannot fall on the Christian believer. No charge will stand. Why? Because we have one who stood in our place. No condemnation will stand because we have one who was condemned in our place. Christ Jesus who died more than that. You see, the, the atoning work of Jesus is not just the Friday event, but the atoning work of Jesus is the whole work of salvation, Friday to Sunday. You want to include even ascension and his heavenly session that he died, he was buried, he rose, he ascended, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's who he is, that's where he is, that's what he did, that's what he is now doing. So question number two is who is he that condemns? Because he's at the right hand, he's not condemning us, he's interceding for us. Your prayer life might be inconsistent, so is mine. But let me tell you that his prayer life is perfect and persistent, that he continually prays, he continually intercedes. And the third and final question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And we have lists here. We have trouble or hardship. Let's just look at those for a moment. Trouble are those things that are outside of ourselves. Hardship or distress can mean those things that are within ourselves, some internal strife, internal struggles. And that really captures everything because the troubles of this life are either outside of ourselves or inside of ourselves. And Paul says, you name it, and the answer is none. What charge will stand? No charge. Who is he that condemns? No one and nothing. And what shall separate us? And the answer is nothing. Nothing in this world, nothing in this life, Nothing in heaven above, nothing in the earth below. Not the past, not the future, not any powers, not any principalities. Because you have that list in verses, from verse 35, in verse 35, and then you have another list from verse 38, which has again these great words, angels, demons, present, future, height, depth, anything else in all creation. So the charge won't stand. No condemnation will be found, and no separation is possible. Now, this is not your view of Jesus. This is not the strength of your faith, the depth of your commitment, but this is the strength of his commitment to you. This is what he says about you. This is what he says to you. This is what he has done for you. And the conclusion of this is mag mag magnificent, because we're told that we are now described as conquerors. No not conquerors, but rather more than conquerors. And with this, I want to bring our time together to a close. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now the audience understood a conqueror. They understood a general or the Caesar who succeeded in battle. Because after the battle, especially a significant battle, there would be a parade. It was called a Roman triumph. These parades could last for days, and they would slowly make their way through the streets of Rome. And it would be like a, a buildup, because at the beginning of the parade, you would have the prisoners of war, the slaves, those captured in battle. You would have the, all the loot or all the treasure that was accumulated because of the victory. Then you would have the soldiers. Then you would have the generals. Then you would have the statesmen, the politicians. And as the triumph 
proceeded through the streets of Rome, the last in the procession was the conqueror, the great general, the Caesar himself, and all eyes would be fixed on him. Now what Paul is saying is take that image of the conqueror, take that image of the victor, Take that image of all the city turning out to celebrate, and he says that is an inadequate image to describe you, Christian, because you're more than that. You're greater than that. Your, your, your status is higher than that. Now, the audience who received this message 2,000 years ago, and I would suggest the audience that receives this message today has great difficulty believing it because it doesn't seem to be true. We look at ourselves and we don't seem to be more than conquerors. We, we, we aren't said to be more than conquerors by the society that surrounds us. Certainly the evil one would never say such a thing about us. But God's word is always true. He speaks the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So if you are in Christ today, you are more than a conqueror through him who loved us. And nothing will be able to separate us, you and me, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, the love of Jesus is not just emotional, though it is, there's an emotional element, of course. It's not just sentimental, but it's powerful, personal. It's a commitment that was achieved on the cross, fulfilled in his work. So he lived, he died, he rose again from the dead, and in him we are more than conquerors. He conquered, and we become conquerors. He succeeded, and we succeed. He won, and we win. But the key is him. If you are in Christ, all of these benefits and blessings belong to you. But if you are outside of him, the charges still stand. The condemnation still stands, and the threat of separation still looms. So with you this morning, I want you to hear what God has to say. What God has to say about his son. What God has to say about the work of his son. And what God has to say about all who trust in his son. That this is who we are. Many years ago, Abraham Lincoln was often asked during the American Civil War whether God is on our side. And famously, he wrote a letter to one of his correspondents that was published in the newspaper. Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. Are you on his side today? Are your, is your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because all of these promises then become yes and amen in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself. It doesn't matter what others say about you. It doesn't matter about your failings or your limitations. But if this is true, and it is, that the weakest of all Christians is more than conqueror through Christ Jesus who loved him, who loved her, and who gave himself for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word, but we also thank you that you accompany your word with your spirit, that the spirit takes this truth and applies this truth to human hearts. And I pray for each one of your people today that you would remind us of these truths, that these, are, these statements are who we are in Jesus Christ. And for any who might be hearing this, who are not yet committed, not yet converted, not yet convinced, might they hear what you have to say about your people? Might they hear what you have to say about your son? Might, you he might they hear what you have to say about his work? And might they place their hope and their faith in him? So there would no be no, no charge, no condemnation, and no separation for them as well. Hear our prayers, Lord. Answer us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen.
holy, we are standing in your glory. You are here, you are holy, we are standing in your glory. You are here, and you are holy, we are standing in your glory. Many thanks for watching and also to everyone who was involved today. As we go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Say you can